laws is if a sitting judge is publicly cens censored, did I say that right? Censured? Oh. Are they still able to remain on the bench? And my, my question was, are, are we are we setting the bar for qualification higher than the bar is for the people that actually have the job? Chairman Curtis, you recognize me? Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a great question. Um, we're, we're talking here about the Board of Professional Responsibility because th the folks who are not yet judges are going to be subject to that. But don't forget, we've got the Board of Judicial Conduct, which has its own s set of you know processes. Uh, and again, that's that's a that's a body that Chairman Bell and I worked very to restructure because we felt like there were some. Um, some, some structural issues with that body. We've corrected those, and we, we, we're, the feedback we're getting from across the state, that's working really, really well. And again, this committee will be asked to consider a piece of legislation later on in our docket that will further strengthen that, that body's um, uh, practices. So that, I would just kind of point to those as two different, two different structures. Are there any follow-up to that, Representative Ogles? No, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the explanation. Okay, very good. And next on the list, I have Representative Clemens. Then you, Representative Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and my t two issues with this piece of legislation, I kind of echo, um, echo what I said in the subcommittee, is one, we're changing the rules in the middle of the game here. We've got elections less than, well, just over a month away. Some of these folks are going to be on these ballots because they've already qualified. And if this were to go into effect, the people of Tennessee will have elected judges and then have their that body we've corrected those and we, we we're the feedback we're getting from across the state that's working really really well and again this committee will be asked to consider a piece of legislation later on in our docket that will further strengthen that that body's um, uh, practices so that I would just kind of point to those in two different two different structures we're getting any follow-up to that Representative Ogles? no thank you chairman thank you for the explanation okay very good and next on the list I have Representative Clemens then to you Representative Garrett Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and my t two issues with this piece of legislation, I kind of echo, um, echo what I said in the subcommittee, is one, we're changing the rules in the middle of the game here. We've got elections less than, well, just over a month away. Some of these folks are going to be on these ballots because they've already qualified. And if this were to go into effect, the people of Tennessee will have elected judges and then have their elected officials um, kind of pulled right out from under them. Uh, so that raised a concern and some legal concerns in my mind about who's already on the ballot, what ballots have already been printed and, and distributed to the public for their consideration. And we're gonna change the rules of the game right in the middle of it. And then as well, we're also um, excluding in this uh, subdivision three here, those who are currently serving in a judicial position as of the effective day of this act. So now we've got differential treatment with judicial candidates versus incumbents not being held to the same standard because somebody could have been elected eight years ago, but they could have been um, publicly censured nine years ago, and they're going to qualify, but now somebody else isn't. So those are just my two concerns. I think we're going to run into some legal challenges on this bill if it passes as is. And so uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and sponsor, um, allowing me to echo those concerns. And thank you for that, Mr. Representative Clemens. Next, I have Representative Garrett. You recognize her? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a practicing lawyer, when I first saw this legislation, it didn't concern me a touch, right? Just a touch. But these four words speak volumes to me as a lawyer when you have an innate trust with a client. You take their money, or maybe you take some sort of settlement you put in your trust account. And that money is not yours. It's not yours to do with what you want to do. These four words, dishonesty, fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation. If a lawyer does any one of those four things, they have no business being a lawyer. Certainly, the time is of the essence that that lawyer that commits a crime, in my opinion, of dishonesty, fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation, they should not be a judge. With that, I'm going to support this legislation. Thank you, Committee and Chairman. Very good. Thank you, Representative Garrett. Representative Brickin, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I think the uh, legislation has merit on its uh, approach, but the the enactment date is my 
biggest problem. I think this could affect uh, an election in my district. I certainly cannot support it because it certainly would look favorably unfavorable on on potential candidates. So, again, if it's effective date of after August um, the fourth, I'm fine with it. But this effective date, because I know these candidates have spent thousands of dollars so far in early primary um, money and and put legislation out there in the middle of a race is just, to me, totally inappropriate. Members, have anything else? Any other questions or comments on the amendment? On the amendment. President Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank you. And and what what is the, I, I didn't know, I don't know what the date is on the amendment. What is the date on the amendment? Uh, Chairman Curcio, you're recognized, sir. Yeah, thanks, sir. It's, uh, this act takes effect upon becoming law. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Kersey. Maybe any, any other questions or concerns on the amendment? And I do have a speaker that's asked to speak today, and I will allow that to happen once we, we get this bill in the proper posture. Uh, looks like we're ready to vote. All those in favor of adopting House Amendment 15648 to House Bill 38, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Ayes have it. The amendment's adopted. Now we're back, now we're back on the bill as amended. Members, do you have any questions on the bill before we go out of session? We're going to hear from uh, Ms. Crystal Jesse. She had she had sent an email to the office and asked to, to speak, and it looks like she's here. So, Ms. Jesse, if you would, members, what we're going to do, we're going to go out of session to hear from Ms. Jesse without objection. And, ma'am, if you would, there's a, a face there in, in front of that microphone. If you hit that, a red light will come on. If you would inter introduce yourself, and then we'll give you three minutes to speak. And then after that, uh, we'll have uh, unlimited time for questions and, and responses from you or whatnot. So go ahead. Thank you. My name is Crystal Jesse, and I am running for circuit court judge in the third judicial district. I am an attorney pro properly licensed in the state of Tennessee in every court in the state of Tennessee. And I'm the only candidate running that's been licensed to sit and practice in front of the United States Supreme Court. I've met many of you because I represent 14 counties in the opioid lawsuit in Tennessee. Though I agree with the bill in concept, what worries me is the specific language and the timing of the bill. We are not in the middle of our election cycle. We're at the end. I started this process May 4th, 2021. My early voting begins April 13th two weeks from sitting here today. We have constituents that have already sent in ballots because they can't make it to the poll. So what we're telling the voters in my case, and this is a law of unintended, unintended consequences because it just doesn't affect me, is that we can have a candidate come out, be properly vetted, put on the ballot, voted for and possibly elected on May 3rd in the primary where my election will be determined Yet if Nashville doesn't like that candidate, you all can change the circumstances and not allow them to take office. I have a lot about the law that I do not agree with, but the main thing I will speak with you today is about election integrity. This is not the type of state and law that we want to run. It takes the choice out of the voters' hands. Had this happened prior to the election and we were all on an even playing field, it would be different. But the law is specific to one part of Rule 8, and it's Rule 8.4C. So you're telling me my opponents can be arrested and plead guilty and be on diversion, and they can run. Or other opponents can have people that have been disbarred or censured or suspended for other avenues under Rule, point eight, under rule 8. But because I received a private censure from something that occurred in 2007... I received the private, the public censure in 2014. Now we want to change the circumstances that I can run for election. So I'm asking you to make it personal about yourself. If you were running for the first time and Tennessee decided to come back into a special session and change your qualifications, how would you feel? Then don't make it about yourself, make it about your daughters. If you don't have a daughter, make it about your wife and grandmother. I have never once in my campaign said vote for me because I'm a woman. Not once because I have been blessed in the practice of law. But let me give you a statistic that's hard and fast. No female has ever went ran a race and won a contested race in the third judicial district. 
what you're doing today, you're telling my voters, if I win, you're taking Tennessee back to prior to August 18th, 1920. And they cannot that, elect the your three, first Your three female. minutes is up now. You have plenty of time for questions. You, you can stand there. You, you may sit if you'd like. Members, do we have any questions for uh, Miss Jesse? Thank you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your your testimony and I'm sorry, what was your last name now? Jesse. Jesse. Jesse or Jessic? Jesse, J E S S E E. Miss Jesse, yes. thank you for being here. Have you been publicly censured? Yes. Okay. In 2014. Did that censure then, as this bill is currently drafted, involve dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation? At the time I was censured, it was Rule 8.4a and 8.c with a parenthesis beside it that says misconduct. So the parenthesis does not say those three things, but because you're encompassing 8.4c, technically I could be under this for acts that occurred in 2007. So I'll still be within the 10 years. So you recognize it, and as long as y'all can have a cordial okay. back and forth, I'm not just going to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. So is it your belief that this legislation would apply to you? I don't know. I'm seeking legal representation as to that avenue. So this could not apply to you, then, right? I'm here worried that it's very specific based upon the timeline of the bill and who originally introduced it that is specific to me. As the law of unintended consequences that it's going to apply to other candidates there's also not a grandfathering clause in it and based upon a simple google search i'm, a search, I'm also worried that it could apply to other sitting judges that are running for re-election are you aware if there's a mechanism that you can dismiss or appeal your censure uh, at the point in time yes of course did you do but that we entered a conditional agreement as said to my censure so then this could lead to your acting as a lawyer in the state of Tennessee as a dishonest under fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. That's what you're currently concerned about, that this legislation would apply to you. No, I'm concerned because I'm two weeks from early voting. I've spent a tremendous amount of money. I'm in a race, and I'm concerned that if my voters elect me on May 3rd, that you're going to tell them that I cannot take the bench due to something that occurred or allegedly occurred in 2007 because of the specific language of your bill. So the conduct surrounding your censure was in 2007, yes. even though the censure was in 2014? Yes, and there was no TCAP provision. There was nothing like that at the time. It was simply a public censure, not a disbarment, not a suspension. So if the lawyer has been censured, it's clearly censured for dishonesty, for fraud, for deceit, for misrepresentation. Is it your opinion that that person is qualified to be a judge? Depends on when it occurred, absolutely. The time frame of this of this legislation is also concerning. We run on eight year time frames. It's ironic that 16 years and then 10 years was chosen originally, but I have a reason that I think that was chosen, so. Well, I'm not trying to make this about you. I'm trying understand. to make this that if a lawyer, yes, and we're all, as lawyers, members of the bar, we're officers of the court, yes. we are an extension of the yes. court, we have an utmost integrity to the court, Absolutely. if there is a lawyer that has been censured, and I'll yes. ask it again, that has been censured, and it's specific to a dishonest, a fraudulent, a deceitful, or an act that rises to the level of misrepresentation, I would ask you again, does that lawyer, is that lawyer qualified to be a judge? Yes, and especially depending on the circumstances. We don't know the time. It's every individual case needs to be judged separately. And based upon when I took out my petition, I was qualified, properly vetted, put on the ballot. Yes, and at the time, as it says in my public censure, with the parentheses mixed conduct. But the way your bill is written, 8.4c is 8.4c so yes depending on the circumstances the time and the situation absolutely thank you that's all i have mr chair <laughs> very good members anyone else and i think that uh i'd like to say a couple things 
no other members have any comments. Um, and we're still out of session. Miss Jesse, if you could stay up here, I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, making policy, it's hard to have a timeline on, on when this body makes policy. And making policy is not an easy thing to do. And unfortunately, we don't make policy around elections or during election time. We're in session every two years. We're elected every two years. Um, and I just have an issue with this particular case because you're standing here saying it's not about you. You're saying it's about you. I'm talking about you being the first woman, X, Y, and Z. This has nothing to do with you being male or female. What, what this has to do with is, 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 is this body... Is this body ready to change the law and say, look, an individual <coughs> who has been found by a federal court to have violated two counts of a federal wiretap statute, then that court went ahead and, and ordered punitive damages against that person. Is that the type of person we want to serve on the bench? And the way that fits is this. It fits because... The public censure has the language of dishonesty and deceit. If I were to be in a situation like that, I would hope that the Board of Professional Responsibility would, would have taken my law license. Because an individual who acts like that doesn't, doesn't need to be an attorney, let alone a judge. Period. End of conversation. So, and you can say, look, can't go back, can't change facts, X, Y, and Z happened then, but we know what's going on now. Times are changing. The information age, you can you can you can do a quick online search and find out so much about somebody and their character. And we're here, this policy today, this bill is about character. It's about character, the type of character, the type of person, male or female, of who we want to serve on the bench, who we want in that black robe, making decisions about your personal life. Those are the policy decisions. This is the policy before in front of this committee today. Nothing else. We're here to make that policy. And unfortunately, it may interfere with your timing or run for judge. And I'm not going to apologize about that. Because I, I, we're here to make policy. Policy doesn't have a set time. So, with that said, I'd be happy to take any remarks you may have. Anything I said, members, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you may have before we move forward. Is it an easy issue? Representative Brussels, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Jesse, for being here. How would you feel to be before a judge that's had a censor for dishonesty? Would you think you'd get a fair trial? Yes. Thank you. Very good. Members, anyone else? All right. Ogles, you recognize them. Thank you for being here today. Just for the record, is there a prior history with the initial legislator that filed this piece of legislation. I'm, I'm kind of confused about this. Yes, my ex-husband did. That I, have a, that I have a daughter with that sat in this committee last week. So it is about being a woman. Thank you for being here. All right, members. We're ready to vote. No, excuse me. All right, thank you. We're going to go back in session without objection. Any other questions for the sponsor on this bill? <laughs> Representative Garrett, you recognize. Thank you for the uh, to the sponsor of the legislation. Is it is it your intent with this legislation that we ensure that we don't have a judge that's on the bench that is a dishonest, fraudulent, deceitful, or misrepresents himself as a judge as he is deciding cases before him? Mr. Chair, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, that's exactly my intent. Professor Garrett, you recognize? And then, so, if a judge has been censured under the Board of Professional Conduct or prior to them becoming a judge censured for this potential legislation under dishonesty, fraud, deceit, misrepresentation, is it your opinion as the sponsor of the legislation that that would disqualify someone from serving as a judge? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, and let me add to that. I'm, I've become very notable in this body for carrying bills dealing with criminal justice reform and understanding that people make mistakes and that people can, in certain instances, recover from those mistakes. That is why this bill 
does not bar someone for life. It's a 10-year timeout. It's a, it's a time to get your life back in order the way it's supposed to be. You stepped out of the lane. You haven't stepped so far that, that you've crossed the line you can't come back from. But we're saying, look, you need to take some time and get your affairs back in order and, and reevaluate your priorities before we're going to put a black robe on you and have you making decisions for people's lives. Uh, I just think that's, uh, especially with the erosion of public trust, with, with you know everything that we see going on across the country as far as not trusting our system of government, our, our judges have got to be above reproach, and that is exactly the intent here. Professor, do you recognize <laughs> Thank you for that. No, nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Very good. And Richard Owens, do you recognize And then to you, Representative Clements. I'd like to make a motion to roll this piece of legislation one week. I was in seven, which I, by my quick math, I think that's 15 years. So the, the intent of your legislation, I think, and her, in this case, I, I, my suggestion was going to say if the offense happened within the 10 year period, uh, to, to be censored for something that went back, you know, almost a half a decade, I, I'm confused about the timetable here. And uh, as written, it sounds like that you could literally be censured for something that happened how far out. I mean, so the, the statute to some degree is as we're voting on this, wouldn't affect a, a 10 year period. In essence, it's going to affect a 15 year period for this young lady to testify. 